This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Why not check out Apocalypse World War I, which draws on over 300 hours of archival footage. Apocalypse World War I traces the journeys of civilians and soldiers who fought for survival in one of the darkest times in history. Examine an era that fundamentally changed the worldwide balance of power from the war's outbreak in 1914 through its duration to the US intervention and the Treaty of Versailles. Curiosity streams available on many platforms. I often read them all out, but look, if you've got a screen, a smart device of some kind, you're gonna be able to watch Curiosity Stream. It's also available worldwide, which is great. So go to curiositystream.com forward slash biographics for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And right now you guys can use the promo code biographics to save 25% off the cost of an annual subscription, which comes out to only $14.99 a year which is crazy cheap. I swear I have streaming services that charge that much monthly. So again, curiositystream.com forward slash biographics, 25% off, which makes it $14.99 for the whole year. And now back to today's video. The Sicilian Mafia has been considered a creeping, unstoppable force whose grip on the territory and the lives of honest citizens cannot be vanquished by the state. The aura of invincibility has taken legendary overtones, as we often see Mafia dons being celebrated as folk heroes in film and fiction. But what of the lawmen who gave all their energies, sanity, and lives to defeat this monster? In today's biographics, we're going to chart the rise, struggles, and controversial methods of one of them. A little-known historical figure, at least outside his native Italy. A man who, in the early 1920s, was pulled out of retirement for one last job, a mandate from Mussolini himself to crush the Mafia, whatever it took. A man who largely succeeded in his task, only to be hindered by the very political structure who had given him full powers. This is the story of Cesare Mori, better known as the Iron Prefect. On the 22nd of December 1871, a boy was born in Pavia, northern Italy. His parents abandoned him at birth, and he was raised in the local orphanage under the name Primo Nerbi. His natural parents acknowledged him only in 1879, and they changed his name to Cesare Mori. A difficult start to life bred a young man accustomed to harsh and disciplined environments. Cesare enrolled in Turin's military academy, and after a stint in the army, he joined the police. After serving in northern Italy, the young officer was put to the test with a transfer to Sicily in 1904. This is when Mori first got first-hand knowledge of that criminal organization known as the Mafia to outsiders and to its members as Cosa Nostra, our thing or our own business. Mafia gangs have been around for at least 40 years. To oversimplify, they were first born as private security companies, protecting the interests of wealthy landowners. Gradually, they branched out into the very criminal activities they were supposed to fight, kidnappings, robberies, and cattle rustling. Eventually, they established a monopoly of armed violence, mainly in rural Sicily. They exploited this position by imposing a crippling protection racket. They were virtually undisturbed in their activities, shielded by a network of corrupt officials, and the omerte of citizens. The murder is often described as a formalized code of silence. It is more of an ingrained habit, bred by generations of mistrust in public authorities and fear of criminal reprisals. Mori would not let himself be intimidated by mafia threats, nor was he discouraged by lack of cooperation. To him, mafioso were just ordinary bandits, and they should be treated as such. He distinguished himself by conducting several high-profile arrests in the province of Trapani, western Sicily, but eventually he got on the wrong side of his superiors. They judged his methods to be too heavy-handed and frequently accused him of abuse of power. Eventually, in January of 1915, he was transferred to Florence, where he was promoted to deputy commissioner. However, a man of his skill could not be kept away from the real action for very long. In May of 1915, the Kingdom of Italy declared war on Austria-Hungary and ended World War I. Thousands of young Sicilians were called to arms, but many of them went AWOL and took to the hills, swelling the ranks of bandit gangs. Not all of these gangs were affiliated to Cosa Nostra, but they shared their methods and tight grip on the territory. The Ministry of the Interior had the right man for the job, Deputy Commissioner Mori. I will not describe all his actions, save for one, to give you an example of Mori's strategy and tactics. In 1916, the lawman 
and set his sights on the gang led by Grisafi. It only included five bandits, but they were heavily armed and could count on a network of allies and informants. Mori's signature strategy consisted of two stages. First, destroy the enemy's supply and support network. Second, surround the foe and force them into a firefight or into surrender. In the Grisafi case, Mori and his men descended upon the town of Calta Bellotta in southwestern Sicily and rounded up some 300 allies of the bandits. The outlaws, now isolated, made a huge mistake. They hoisted a black flag above their mountain hideout, signifying their will to fight on. Mori took up the gauntlet and launched a surprise attack surrounding the enemy base. When Mori entered their cave, he found the Grisafi and friends had escaped through a secret passage, leaving behind their horses and a military-grade arsenal. The deputy commissioner was a capable sleuth. He ordered his men to set the horses free and to follow them. The habit-loving animals naturally rode to another location, a farmhouse which turned out to be a second lair for the gang. Time for stage two. Mori's men surrounded the house at night, ready for stealth action. But the outlaws spotted the police force and opened fire. An intense firefight ensued in which Mori directed concentrated volleys of rifle rounds against the doors and windows of the farm. The building was almost demolished by the bullets, but luckily no side suffered any casualties. Eventually, the gang surrendered. This and other successes made Mori a household name and a hero celebrated by the press. Yet the lawman was far from happy. He knew it dealt a crippling blow to some of the foot soldiers fighting for the Cosa Nostra, but he also was aware that the criminal organization's leaders and patrons were still hiding in high places. The true lethal Lethal blue to the mafia will be given when we are able to make roundups in prefectures, police headquarters, employers' mansions, and ministries. Following his promotion, the commissioner was transferred again, ending up in Bologna, where he served from February 1921 to August 1922. On that occasion, he was appointed prefect. In the Italian civil service, the prefect is the representative of the government for a province. While not a member of the police forces, a prefect has the authority to coordinate their strategy and activities. Mori landed in Bologna at the worst possible time. The fascist party was on the rise. Its members, organized in paramilitary squads of black shirts, roamed Bologna and its suburbs, engaging in violent action against communist workers on strike and left-leaning farmers. Elsewhere, police forces turned a blind eye to fascist street violence. They were seen as the lesser evil, a necessary nuisance which could contain and prevent a communist uprising in Italy. But Mori would not have any of that. On the 25th of May, some hundred black shirts led by former Navy Captain Cavadoni laid siege on the town of Santa Viola, attacking farm laborers and factory workers with hand grenades. The prefect's response was decisive. He sent a detachment of Carabinieri, a militarized police force akin to the French gendarme. Mori's men dispersed the fascists, arresting many of them, but Cavadoni got away. Later that night, his body was found in Bologna, torn apart by a grenade. His fellow party members alleged he had been killed by the communists and bayed for blood. But a police inquiry led by Mori found that Cavadoni had died by accident while assaulting a farmer's cooperative. The local section of the Nationalist Fascist Party intensified their actions against communists and socialist organizations. But most of all, they declared war on the prefect. 20,000 black shirts convened on Bologna, demanding for Mori to resign. The tough lawman responded by barricading the prefecture and the police headquarters, resisting attacks from militiamen and political pressure to quit his job. Eventually, in August, the Ministry of the Interior transferred Mori to Bari, southern Italy. The black shirts had now got free reign over Bologna. A few weeks later, at the end of October 1922, the fascist party staged their march on Rome. King Victor Emmanuel III appointed Benito Mussolini il Duce as prime minister of a new coalition government. With the new cabinet in place, Mori was quickly dismissed and sent to an early retirement in Florence. But it wouldn't last for long. In May of 1924, Benito Mussolini traveled to Sicily for an official visit. He and other party leaders were aware of the blight of Cosa Nostra. Their political program was founded on law and order, therefore they could not tolerate the presence of large criminal organizations. And yet, the Mafia had backed fascists and their allies in local elections, a common practice inherited from previous political systems. The visit was the occasion for Il Duce to draw a clean slate and sever any connections between the local administration and crime. On the 9th of May, he declared an speech, it should not be tolerated any longer that a few hundred delinquents overwhelm, impoverish, and damage a magnificent people such as this. The last straw was drawn by Mayor Don Francesco Cuzia of a small town near Palermo. The politician and mafia boss glanced at Mussolini's bodyguards and told the Duce, you are with me, you are under my protection, what do you need all these cops for? The leader was furious. How could a two-bit Don believe he could be above the law? How could he believe his crime syndicate be a replacement 
for the state. Mussolini resolved to crush Cosa Nostra. He needed a lawman with a proven track record and knowledge of the territory. More importantly, he needed someone who would not be intimidated by a powerful opponent. Well, how about one of the few prefects who had actively opposed the rise of fascism? And that's when Mori received the call. Retirement was over. On the 2nd of June 1924, Mori was appointed the prefect for the mafia-riddled province of Trapani. Mussolini gave him clear instructions. You have carte blanche. The authority of the state must be absolutely re-established in Sicily. If the laws in force hinder you, this will be no problem. We will draw up new laws. Mori immediately applied stage one of his strategy, undermine the power base of the mafia. In this specific case, he focused on weakening the military strength of the local gangs. First, he withdrew all permits to carry firearms. Then he heavily regulated the recruitment of the Campieri. These were armed watchmen looking after large estates, many of whom were hired as foot soldiers by Cosa Nostra. Now all Campieri had to be scrutinized and appointed by a provincial commission. Then Mori went on the attack, targeting the most profitable criminal enterprise around Trapani cattle rustling. Traditionally, stolen cattle were butchered and sold on the black market, but in recent years, the Mafia Dons had found that they could make more money by holding large herds at ransom. Mori reasoned that rustlers had to look after the kidnapped animals. Traveling across the countryside on horseback, Mori identified the likely routes where criminals could find fresh water, food, and shelter for the cattle. With accurate maps in hand, the police and carabinieri were able to ambush hundreds of cattle rustlers red-handed. The prefect continued to repress organized crime well into 1925. His methods were harsh, even brutal, so much so that a delegation of fascists from Trapani wrote a petition to Mussolini demanding that Mori be transferred somewhere else. The petition ended up in the bin, and its signatories were all expelled from the party. The prefect not only continued to operate, but was even promoted. On the 20th of October 1925, he was appointed the prefect of Palermo, the regional capital. As such, he would have authority to fight the mafia across the entire island. The Iron Prefect took to the task with a grand strategic plan. He was to conquer the hearts and minds of Sicilians, to restore their trust in institutions, and demolish the sense of fear of respect which ordinary citizens placed on mafioso. On the operational level, he would approach the task as a military campaign. He assembled his army, which he dubbed the Interprovincial Police Squads. This was a force of some 800 policemen and carabinieri with jurisdiction over the whole of Sicily and answering only to him. He took great care in recruiting officers who were local to the mafia-infested areas so that they could easily blend in and collect intelligence. The interwar provincial police would target one town, village, or entire district at a time. First, undercover officers identified the local mafioso and their allies. Then they left the area, allowing for the waters to quiet down. In the meantime, uniformed officers surrounded and cordoned off the area of operations. Finally, Mori's men swept in, swiftly carrying out massive roundups, which resulted in hundreds of arrests. This method required the targeted criminals to occupy the same area at the same time. Should this not happen naturally, Mori resorted to a shrewd tactic. He had realized that gangs in the provinces relied for strategic direction on the Palermo families, the so-called Dome. Exploiting this fact, he forged messages from the Dome asking subordinates to meet in a secret location. These meeting places were not secret to the interprovincial squads who descended upon their quarry in force. When possible, the prefect refrained from open firefights with the outlaws. He always preferred to confiscate their goods and arrest their network of allies and families, thus forcing them to surrender. Such methods erred on the heavy-handed side, resulting in the arrest of innocent civilians and the destruction of their property. Mori even encouraged his younger policemen to move in with the wives of bandits on the lam, threatening their honor. This was an affront that no full-blooded Sicilian would tolerate, and many men left their lairs with vendettas in mind only to be immediately arrested. In some cases, though, arrests were not that easy. Leaders and gangs did not fall into Mori's traps and opened fire, resulting in pitched battles with the police force. For those occasions, Mori had issued specific instructions to his men. Should the confrontation happen at night, shoot only if absolutely necessary. They had to exploit darkness and stealth to creep in on their targets. If shots were fired during the day, it's a whole different story. Mari's men had been trained to encircle the enemy in tight formation whilst keeping cover and then open fire in a concentrated fashion. The approach stunned the outlaws on most occasions, leading them to accept surrender. But some mafioso could boast remarkable arsenals and had no qualms in firing back with mouths of rifles, heavy machine guns, or hand grenades. Heavy casualties were suffered on both sides. But enough of theory. Let me give you a practical example. The Siege of the Town of Ganji. Mari's most celebrated accomplishment. The effective yet heavy handed operation would earn him the title of Iron Prefect, bestowed by the national press. <laughs> 
At the end of 1925, the prefect had planned to score a spectacular success to increase the prestige of his forces and show to the Sicilian people that the state could be relied upon. On the 1st of January 1926, the Iron Prefect chose the site for his pitched battle, Gunji, within the Palermo province, home to a gang 130 strong. Mori first ordered his squads to surround a circular area around Gunji with a 20 kilometer radius. As he expected, with the police and the winter cold creeping in, many suspects flocked to the town. Once this happens, the force moved closer to the town, occupying the farms owned by the mafioso and their supporters, confiscating goods and slaughtering cattle. The bandits felt the noose tight and went into hiding, occupying well stocked, well concealed lairs underneath street level. At this stage, Mori received reinforcements from Palermo, which included units of his old black shirt foes. With this formidable force, Mori and his right hand man, police commissioner Spano, completely cordoned off Ganji. The prefect sent a telegram to the mayor, which was relayed to the other inhabitants via a town crier. I summon the fugitives and bandits who are in your territory to give themselves up within 12 hours, on the lapse of which I shall proceed to extreme measures. The ultimatum went unheeded, and so came the measures. More animals were slaughtered and sold to townsfolk at bargain prices. All the wells supplying Ganji with water were shut down, and many houses belonging to mafioso were occupied by Mori's and Spano's squads. There were even allegations that these men raped the wives and daughters of the fugitives. The locals, while not happy with what amounted to military occupation, started to lose respect for those made men whom they had feared and supported just a few days earlier. After ten days of tense standoff, one by one, the mafioso of Ganji surrendered to the man the press called the Iron Prefect. In his memoirs, Mori describes that the citizens of Gunji burst into a Homeric burst of laughter, mocking the fate of these legendary criminals. Following the victory at Gunji, the Iron Prefect replicated the approach in other Mafia strongholds. In a subsequent roundup, the interprovincial squads locked their handcuffs on the blood-stained wrists of Don Vito Cassio Ferro, a high-ranking boss considered to be the inventor of the protection racket. Mori also cracked down on a widespread practice in rural areas. Mid- and larger state owners were cowed by mafioso into renting out their lands and properties at ridiculously low prices. These lands remained largely unproductive, and landlords suffered heavy financial losses. While not as exciting as a siege or a roundup, Mori's instigation of a large-scale review of tenancy contracts ended up with these nefarious tenants being pushed out of the countryside. But as Mori's methods were praised by fascist propaganda, his methods also came under question for being too brutal and downright illegal. Once again, allegations landed on Mussolini's desk that the prefect and his men indulged in rape, torture, and hostage taking. Nonetheless, the Iron Prefect and Commissioner Spano pressed on with their crusade, backed by a third ally, the judicial system. This was state attorney and head prosecutor Luigi Giampietro, who collected thousands of witness accounts and was able to drag to court some pretty big fish. For example, the prefect and the prosecutor built a dossier against fascist MP Alfredo Cuzzo, who was accused of receiving kickbacks and favors from mafia families. The trial started in November of 1927, and Cuzzo was initially found guilty and expelled from the party. This apparent victory, though, turned sour for the Iron Prefect. The MP appealed his sentence, and the trial dragged on into 1929. In the meantime, Cuzzo's dismissal created a vacuum of power within the Sicilian section of the fascist party, which was quickly filled in by larger state owners that were as cozy with the Mafia as their predecessor. Meanwhile, pressure had grown for the Duce to remove Mari from his duties. Enough was enough. Mussolini obliged and sweetened the pill with an appointment as senator. And after all, it looked like the lawman had achieved his goals. By 1929, 11,000 people were dragged to court. Many of them were innocent civilians caught in the indiscriminate roundups of Mori's squads. Many more were acquitted after key witnesses were threatened or killed. But 1,200 mafioso were given sentences ranging from a few months in prison to life. An unprecedented result. More importantly, crime rates had plummeted. When Mori took charge in 1925, the province of Palermo had recorded 268 homicides, 298 robberies, and 45 acts of cattle rustling. In 1929, there had been only five murders, three robberies, and a mere two cases of stolen herds. By looking at these figures, it looked as though Cosa Nostra had been thoroughly and utterly crushed. This was confirmed by a former mafioso turned informant. The mafia hardly existed anymore. Mafioso had a hard life. The music changed. In truth, the now Senator Mori had won many battles, but he had not won the war. Most of the foot soldiers and many of the mid-level bosses had been wiped out, but the dome of top-level dons had barely been touched. 
Many of them had fled the country. People like Carlo Gambino and Joseph Bonanno relocated to New York, contributing to the rise of organized crime in the U.S. And what about the campaign to win the hearts and minds of Sicilians? Many civilians had indeed lost respect for criminals and had an increased sense of pride and trust in the government. But Mori had failed to address the socioeconomic conditions which had pushed many youngsters into the arms of organized crime. If anything, it made them worse. After landowners had been freed from the scourge of bargain price leases, they took advantage of the situation by increasing rent by a thousand percent. This affected most rural workers and sharecroppers, creating a generation of impoverished and angry Sicilians ripe for the taking. In his later years, Senator Mori continued to voice his views on Sicily and the Mafia. He insisted that the government still had to invest more time and resources into solving the problems of that land, but few ears were eager to listen to his complaints. The once lauded Iron Prefect died in relative obscurity on the 5th of July 1942. His memoirs were published in 1932 with the title The Last Struggle with the Mafia. Alas, the title proved to be wishful thinking. On July the 9th, 1943, Allied forces landed in Sicily, driving out Axis forces in a matter of weeks. Following the invasion, the Allies appointed civil servants, which did not have any ties to fascism. Unfortunately, many of them had ties to Cosa Nostra, or were members of the old families returned from their exile in the States. In many cases, these former bosses and made men had even collaborated with Anglo-American forces, providing useful intelligence and contacts. The work of the Iron Prefect had been undone in a span of less than 15 years, and Cosa Nostra would return to play the land more powerful than ever. Sure, Mori's methods were controversial, and many of his tactics would not find a place in modern democracy, and four years of activity could not instigate the sweeping social reforms needed to eradicate organized crime. But his story proves that even a cancer within the state, such as Cosa Nostra, can be effectively fought. Some of Mori's methods, including targeting the wealth of bosses and staging large show trials, would be picked up by later generations of lawmen, such as public prosecutors Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino, whose stories we might tell another day.